Do you remember when Justice Antonin Scalia died? He was that super, super conservative judge who argued against things like affirmative action, gay marriage, and Obamacare. And when he died, you saw one of two responses on Facebook. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Or God bless his wonderful, magical, constitutional soul. But while y'all were arguing his politics and, well, the relative worth of his life with strangers on the internet, there was a liberal lion who stood every bit as tall as he did, right there on the same court, mourning the loss of her best friend. That's right, the notorious RBG, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a woman who practically wrote the books on gender and equal protection, had a friendship with the Supreme Court's most conservative conservative. The same judge who once asked, if we can't have moral feelings against homosexuality, can we have them against murder? Their mutual respect and affection was so anachronistic for today's political climate, people made an opera about it. It was a friendship that transcended politics, even though they were frequently trying to push the same court and the same nation in opposite directions. Now, as I've said before, I'm not a lawyer, but the little bits and pieces about RBG and Scalia kind of distill down to this. Scalia was a big believer in the stability of the law. For him, laws have to have a fixed meaning. Otherwise, judges could just come in and rewrite laws whenever they wanted. And that gives those in power even more control over who gets punished and who doesn't while Ginsburg had a different perspective. She recognized Scalia's worry about judges rewriting laws all willy-nilly. Judges are human and they are flawed. But if you go back three or 30 or 300 years, the people who first wrote the laws were flawed too. Goodness, person didn't even include black people or women in the 1700s. <laughs> Societies aren't perfect. They always wrongfully have outcasts and untouchables, people who are ignored and stepped on and abandoned. And it's the RBGs of this world that see them and ask, how do we protect these people? How do we make the world a better, a more fair place? And for the kids on the island, that's where Marcy comes in. She sees herself as a leader, if not the leader of the group, because she's always looking out for the little guy. Sure, she organizes festivals, plans harvests, calendars the seasons, but most important, she's there to fight for equality. When Connor arrives on the island, she is the first to welcome him into the community. When Monkey can't find enough to eat, she'll bring the kids together to help forage. And when Juniper's rerouted the mountain spring away from Duncan's field, she'll help negotiate a fair solution. And she prides herself on her neutrality and her informed decision-making, which requires context and empathy. So she's a bit of a busybody. One of the most delightful and infuriating quirks is her island encyclopedia of literally everything we know. She's constantly checking in on everyone to see how they're doing and what they're doing and why they're doing it. And she makes these helpful little guidebooks that catalog everything being done and the right way to do it. And sure, it's well meant, but it can kind of rub the other kids the wrong way. Cyrus likes to sum them up as a way for Marcy to tell us what to do, even when she isn't around. Mostly the kids just ignore them. June in particular gets a new volume every time an experiment goes haywire, summing up everything that she did wrong and how not to do it again. June has stacks and stacks and stacks of them around her house. Uses them for coasters, propping up tables. Um, but here's the thing. Although the kids are ignoring them, a lot of those guidebooks would actually be useful if read. And that self-appointed organizing spirit, well, it, it may rustful some feathers, but contingency plans for flash floods don't write themselves. And the kids will still look to Marcy when the rains pick up. So... Marcy teams up with Duncan quite a bit. He's a big believer in rules to keep everyone safe, and she's a big believer in rules to keep everything fair, and to make little improvements around the island here and there. 
So when those two things overlap, he's the powerhouse that enforces the rules that she's laid out. But when they disagree, that's Muhammad Ali versus Frazier. A fight to see. Still, a fights with Marcy are short-lived, and in the end, she's just a positive, well-meaning, type A kid with a ton of energy and an irrepressible desire to make her community a better place. She's the first to raise her hand and the first to volunteer, and she's a bottomless fountain of energy, always willing to go the extra mile to help out. Kind of like Justice Ginsburg, who's 85 years old and still works out every day and whose law school experience included not just the actual law school work itself, but also taking care of a sick husband and figuring out the lessons taught in his classes so he could keep up, and parenting a toddler all at the same time, always on, always in motion. My name is Laura, and this is a bit on a character for Fish and Ships, an animated show that illustrates multiculturalism and economics through character-driven stories. Like and follow me here on Facebook or YouTube, or check out the artwork on Instagram. Thanks for watching.